Incredible. That represents what today is about. It's Easter, so we're glad you're here at Daybreak. My name is Jeff Eckert. I'm the lead pastor. This is my wife, Arianne, and we're glad you're here. Welcome to Daybreak, and happy Easter. So you might be here for the first time, and if you're a guest, we're so glad you're here. we got a couple things we have for you, but if you're a regular, we're glad you're here as well. We're here to celebrate something amazing, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. You're in the house, and you are a student up to fourth grade. We'd love for you to check out Hip Town. 
out the doors to the left. They have a special gift for you. You can go now with your parent or after service. If you are in middle school or high school, we'd love to invite you down to Norms at the right of the sanctuary when you leave. And there's a free gift for you, and it might be a donut and a drink. So Ooh, I'm going. <laughs> All right. Now, we realize there's a lot of us here in the house. There's some of you on Daybreak Live. We're glad that we're all here because we're celebrating what God does when we get those grave clothes removed from our own lives, just like what we saw here today. Throughout the centuries, on this day that's celebrated as Resurrection Day, Easter, there's been a greeting Christians have given to each other where one would see them on Easter and say, He is risen, and they would respond by saying, He is risen indeed. This has gone on for centuries, and we're going to do that here this morning. So all of us here in the house, I want to say, He is risen. I want you to respond by saying, He is risen indeed. All right, let's try it. Hopefully we get it right the first time. I want some volume here. All right, here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hey, that's pretty good. All right, if you're in the house, stand up right now. And I want you to practice that greeting on a few people. Say hello to at least four or five people here. Let's go. 
life by giving me the desire to help other people. He's a friend. Uh, he's the savior of my life. Jesus has made an impact on my life. But if I had to pick top two, the first one would be allowing myself to forgive others and myself for the past. And secondly, it would be for Neymar and I to be able to fix a broken foundation uh, that we had in our marriage. Hi, I'm Braylon, and God um, shows me how to help people. Jesus has changed my life uh, from the point where I thought about more myself, and then I started thinking about others first. One way God has changed my life is my passion for music and sound. No one else in my family has that passion, so I like to think of it as God's gift to me. Hey man, Jesus has changed my life. He's given me freedom. He's given me peace in my life that I can't even understand. When I invited Jesus into my life, I really experienced freedom for the first time and what that truly meant. And all of those things that I was worried about and concerned about really became so small and so insignificant. For this man who needs amazing kind of praise For forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day There was Jesus when it seems like that, that veil, I call it the veil between heaven and earth. Sometimes it seems a little thick and sometimes it can seem really thin, like you're really close, like you can sense the supernatural. I, I, I know that Easter is a day that we celebrate and it's a day that we are turned to the supernatural. We live and our eyes can see the natural world, but I believe that Easter, there are moments when, when the veil gets thin and there's something that you can see maybe that you wouldn't normally see. Uh, long ago, just, not, just a few days after we got married, my wife and I, Arian, we found ourselves in a canoe on a youth group trip, and we were newlyweds. We were responsible for all these kids, and we were going down this river, and it had been raining, so it was like a little intense. And a lot of non-experienced canoers, and we got to this point where a couple of our girls, three of our girls in this one canoe were kind of stranded on the side. We went over to try to help them. Well, we made things worse. We bumped into them, and their 
canoe started to tip, and it, then it started to fill with water. So here we are to help. We're responsible for these kids, right? So their canoe starts to go down, and we come up beside them, and we're trying to help them get out. And there was one of our young ladies in the middle, and she couldn't get out of this boat, and it's starting to flip over. And the boat flips over, and all of a sudden, two hands grab onto the side of our canoe. And I look down, and we could see her face. I can just still see it in my mind as time kind of froze, and the water is just rushing over her face, and she's desperately trying to pull herself up against the current. Now, it's important to pause here for a minute and just bring you in on a little fact that this particular student, this girl... She wasn't just any one of our normal kids. She was the pastor's kid. My boss, the pastor. And so I was a little nervous and time just froze and I literally did not know what to do because I thought here we are a few days in to this life that we had felt called to to help young people at a church, at this church And now we're going to lose one of them, and my job is over, and we're going to see this tragedy. And I really just froze. I didn't know what to do. I don't know if I've ever felt that way, but just like time went really fast, and then it just stopped. And I just literally just sat there frozen. And my wife assessed the situation. She reached down immediately into the water and against the current, Something happened within her. It's like she became Xena warrior princess at that moment. And she reached down and against the current with with the person weighing more than she did, pulled her up into the boat and rescued her. And I was just amazed and I'm still kind of frozen. And I looked at her and I thought, I'm kind of scared of her right now. I don't know what she might do. And I'm going to be honest, I've been a little scared ever since, like seeing that. But it was like that moment in time where there was this thinness. I thought, this could be it. This could be it. We could see something that could change our lives forever. And when it comes to what we're talking about today, when it comes to Easter, Easter is a moment Throughout the centuries, and we're going to look at some of the very first examples, it's a moment where the veil was probably about as thin as it gets to where we could peer to the other side. And that's what I'm praying. My prayer, and many people have been praying for us this morning, my prayer for you is that you would see through the veil today. That you would see into the supernatural, just maybe just for a moment. And in a few moments, I'm going to invite you to respond. You may have noticed if you're here in the house, there are some, there are some things here on the sides. And we're going to talk about that. But you have an opportunity to, to respond and allow this moment to be what God wants it for you to be today. And for those of you that are guests, we're again, we're so glad you're here. And... Elementary kids, I want to remind you, get something on your way out. They got a good gift for you. I think it's a gift card to five below. Students, you got donuts down on that end of the building. Adults, they got nothing for you. Okay? But we're we're in this series, and we've been talking about what it means to be all in in our faith. We've been talking about what happens in a moment or a powerful series of moments when God changes our reality. And so I want to invite you, if you're, if you're a guest here, if you're new, we'd love to have you come back. We're in this series. Next week, we're going to be in week four. And on your way out, actually, you know what? I do have a gift for you, adults. If you want to grab one of these study guides to go with you, it has a little Bible reading every day, and it'll help you track with what we're doing. And if you need a, some direction for your, your time, maybe you want to spend with God every day in the Bible, this is a great gift. Go pick one up. It's on me today, all right? Does that sound good? I just made that up, but go ahead and take one with you, all right? Now, we've got a lot of guests here, but I want to recognize two special guests that are here, and they've been gone for a while, and the last time they were here, we celebrated them with a big party, and then they just took off and traveled all over the country And this is their first Sunday back, and that's our founding leaders and our founding pastor, Wes and Claudia Doom. Would you guys stand, and we just want to recognize you here this morning. (laughs) 
I told Wes, this is my first Easter message. If I faint or something weird happens, you're up, so get ready. Now, for your party, we, we took a collection and we got some wells built over in Africa. Those were just put up. We want you to see. These are in Liberia. And if you see, this, that sign there says, in honor of Wes and Claudia Dupin. We want to thank you for all of your service here and your work. Very grateful. Very grateful. We're going to look at, we're going to look at three stories today in Scripture. These are three powerful moments. We're going to think about how those moments can connect with our world and your life today. And we're reading out of, there's four Gospels in the Bible. There's four different versions, different stories. They give us different viewpoints and perspectives on the life and teachings of Jesus. You can see here a little bit about what these Gospels are. We're going to look at actually three of them really quickly today, different stories. We're going to talk about these moments when the veil was thin. And the first one is in Luke chapter 8. Jesus was on his way somewhere, and listen to what happens. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. And she came up behind him, and she touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. I don't know if you get the pictures, lots of people crowding in here. And Jesus said, who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. In other words, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And then the woman, seeing that she could go, not go unnoticed, she came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This was a moment when Jesus wasn't in the plan. He was on his way somewhere else, and someone was there who was desperate. And Jesus, as he was walking, I brought this here with me. My daughter uh, brought this back when she went to Israel a few years ago. She brought this prayer shawl. And when the scripture says that she touched the edge of his cloak, this is actually what he was wearing, something like this with tassels on the end. This is what a teacher would wear in those times. And as he was walking through the crowd, it says that when she reached out and touched the edge of his cloak, this is actually what she was reaching for. She was reaching not just for any particular random piece of clothing. She was reaching for this. This has a lot of symbolism. The colors, everything about this, there, there was symbolism that went way back hundreds of years before that we we won't get into today but but it was a a, a traditional uh thing that that the teachers would wear it was called a tzitzi and she reached out to touch this believing that if she touched this that her solution would be there and sure enough it was And as Jesus was wearing this and as the woman was there, I want you to put yourself in her shoes and think about the fact that she had had this issue for 12 years. I don't know if you've ever had a problem that's lasted that long, but if you've raised teenagers, maybe you know what I'm talking about. 12 years, no solution. No one was able to help her. And it's not like she hadn't tried. She tried. And Because of this particular situation, not being able to stop bleeding in her body, she was considered by the religious folk unclean. And that meant a few significant things that helps us understand her situation, that that she was kind of shunned. She wasn't allowed in a normal place of worship. In other words, she, she really wasn't welcomed in. And here she finds herself kind of as an outcast and alone and not really in with the religious crowd, but hoping somehow... She could find a solution because she was really probably at her last try. And so she pressed through that crowd and she reached in and got her miracle. She got her solution. It reminds me of when I look around at the world today and maybe you, you're looking for a solution. You got a situation. 
And it might be a health situation like hers where you cannot get the answer and you've tried and you've prayed and maybe you've sought and you've paid and you've done everything and you cannot get an answer. Or maybe it's a broken relationship from your past. Maybe it's something that you're looking for for help or guidance or comfort. Maybe it's possessions, things, stuff, or trips, or status, or sexual fulfillment. There, there could be lots of things that could fill in that blank for us where we're, we're trying to find a solution. We've got a problem, and we're trying to figure it out, and we've done everything we can. And some of you here in the house, and some of you on Daybreak Life, you've literally tried everything. And here's what I want to say to you is that just like a false god, those things will always over-promise and under-deliver for you. That you will look at those things and you'll think that you'll find your happiness, your contentment, your solution, your answer. But one day that vacation will end and that car you wanted will break down and that sexual fulfillment won't fill the void the substance that you are depending on and looking to, the relationship, all those things will let you down. They will not fulfill the answer that you have because that answer is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the solution to anything that you face. Well, we know that it's Easter and we know that it's Resurrection Sunday And that brings us to a second story in the book of John. And in John, there were two young men, Peter and John, John who wrote this account for us. They were followers and disciples of Jesus. And it says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. This is where Jesus was buried and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple that Jesus loved. This is John. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, but we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying in there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. So here they are. It's still dark. Mary Magdalene was there. She didn't have her iPhone with her, so she had no flashlight. She couldn't see. And she's looking around, and she saw enough to realize that the stone had been moved. So she ran back and got these young men and they went and they saw for themselves. And what they saw when they looked in that tomb, and John gives us so much description here, but they saw the miracle. They saw when Jesus was embalmed after he died. Earlier in this account of John, he goes into great detail to tell us a lot about this, but he was, when he was embalmed, by those that cared for him. Jesus' body was, was embalmed with strips of linen, about 100 pounds of spices, myrrh and some other aloes. And, and this was to become a, a, a cocoon as it hardened over the next few hours. And so Jesus was placed in there, and this is what they saw. They saw, they saw the strips of linen still lying in their shape in their place, right where they were. And John helps us understand, especially when we look at the original language here, that it was just like it had happened. That cocoon was still there. And Jesus wasn't. Now for Jesus to, or for anyone to try to get out of a situation like that, you'd literally have to be cut out. But there was no cut. There was no rip. There was no tear It was still there. And it says that they saw and believed. 
They had been with Jesus. They knew him. They knew the stories. They saw the miracles. They were there firsthand to see what was going on. And now all of a sudden, they realized the truth that they discovered. They saw this truth. And you may be here, and maybe you know the stories. Maybe you know the background. Maybe you've been to Easter services. Maybe this is a common thing for you. But on a day like today, it's, it's such a powerful reminder for all of us, no matter where we are and what we know or think we know, that the truth of the matter is that Jesus was who he says he was. He was God in human flesh. That his resurrection was supernatural. It was the power over death that Jesus displayed that can be living within all of us. There was a truth there. And some of you, that truth may have been an obstacle or maybe is an obstacle where you think, is it real? I've known, I've heard the stories, I know what Easter is. But what's truth? What's real? Skepticism might be your barrier. There's there's an incredible movie If you're wondering about these type of questions, it's called The Case for Christ. I would encourage you, it's viewable online, look this up. It was released in theaters a few years ago, and it's a powerful movie if you have those questions. But we live in a world today where it's like, well, what's true? We don't know. What what we see in our screen sometimes, many of us have become very skeptical, and we wonder, like, what's real, what's not? When we hear, when we see... And we live in a world that can look at the same thing and just see different truth. It's called my truth. That's my truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. So there's a picture here I want you to look at. See this picture. Let's talk about truth for a minute. What do you see? What color is this shoe? Just say it out loud. Okay, I'm hearing different things, so I don't know what's real. Claudia, what color do you see when you look at... You see pink. Wes? Wes? He says he sees white. I don't believe you. How many people here see green? Of any kind. Green laces. Let's just put it out there, all right? And how many see white laces and a pink shoe? You happen to be right, because that's what I see. Just saying. Here's another one. Here's another one. Okay, same kind of thing. How many of you are seeing green up there somewhere? I don't know what you're looking at. I don't know what you're talking about. How many people see pink of some kind? Okay. Again, I think you guys are right. And I think we got one more. They tell me this one's somewhat different. How many people see pink on this one? Does anybody see anything else? Okay. Some of you see white. Man. Well, this really is such a great way to think about the world today, isn't it? We look at things and we go, what's real? That's what I see. I don't know what you see, but all that matters is what I see. It's my truth. It's my life. It's my thing. But Jesus doesn't give us room for that. There's truth. And when these disciples discovered that, it changed the direction of their life forever. Their lives would never be like they were. They were marked by this moment And the direction changed for them. Last story is in Matthew. In Matthew 27, we read this. And when Jesus had cried out, he's on the cross. Again, in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life and they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Here's what I want you to catch. We just kind of read right through it quickly. This veil in the temple that was torn from top to bottom. You're going to see a picture of the temple here. This was the temple in Jerusalem. This was the most holy and sacred geographical space on earth to the Jews. And this was in the city of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. And this particular place where this veil was separated what was called the holy place 
from the Holy of Holies. It was very sacred. In fact, it was so sacred that in the holy place, outside this curtain, only the priests could go. And then going back into this other inner place, the Holy of Holies, the most separate place, the most sacred space, only the high priest, only one person could go there. And they could only go there one time a year. This curtain that stood there was probably about 60 feet tall, about 30 feet wide, about as wide as your hand, four or five inches thick. It was said that it took 300 priests to maneuver this because of its weight. I want you to imagine that this space there, at the moment that Jesus died, this curtain just ripped. And it doesn't say it ripped from bottom to top. And from what we understand and know, this veil could not have been altered by human hands. It was the hand of God. And there's a symbolic thing happening here. And I, I've thought about whenever that was, that was a busy time in Jerusalem and in the temple. There was a lot going on. But the person to discover this veil had to have been one of two people, either a priest or the high priest himself, Caiaphas. And as they were standing there looking, I'm sure, in shock, maybe they didn't ever understand the symbolism of what that act of God did. It separated the separation. It allowed us to enter in because of Jesus to the most sacred space. And he discovered that day the way. I have a question for you today, and that's, what do you need? Some of you need salvation because Jesus is the only way. Some of you need direction in your life. And some of you are looking for a solution. And Jesus is the answer to all those things. In just a few moments, those of you that are here in the house today, I'm going to invite you into a moment where I hope for you that the veil is thin because there are these symbols here on the sides and they're colored in different ways. There's some that are stamped red with the word awakened, and that represents those of you that would say, I need salvation. You know, Jesus came to the earth to save us from our sin and our selfishness, which left unchecked will lead to our destruction. And if you admit your need for God, that your life's on the wrong track, and you believe and who Jesus is and what he did. And you believe in that and you receive it. That's a moment when your eternity is secure. That God will give you eternal life. And I made that decision. And many of us here have made that. But maybe some of you have it. And I want you to know that Jesus is the way. He's the only way. We went to a friend of ours. Um, their big fancy ranch a few years ago. And when we... Before we got there, he said, now when you get there, there's a gate, and there's a road that goes in, and there's a code, and they gave us the code, and we got up, and the gate was there, and the road was there, and then we, we entered in the code. There was one gate, one code, one road. That's it. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this, this red represents salvation. Maybe you're looking for direction in your life. And there are those that are stamped blue saying, I need direction. I need God to lead my way. And some of you are saying, I need a solution. There are some of these that are stamped green. We're going to invite you in a minute to go get those. We're going to hear a song. And it was written by, by Lou, our lead guitarist. And many of you know Lou. And Lou, Lou wrote a song about his experience with Christ. And we're going to hear that song. And as we hear it, we're going to have the opportunity to respond. And this song talks about what happens when God changes a life. When the veil gets thin. When you can see and peer into eternity. 
So in a moment as we sing this song, I'm going to invite you. You have a commitment card. I want you to take that card that was in your seat. I want you to look at it for a minute. There's a card that each one of you have. And on that card, it says, Today I declare that Jesus is my way. He's my salvation. He's my truth. It's not your truth, but he's the truth. And he is my life. He's the solution I'm looking for. And if God's moving in your heart, I want you to just begin to fill that out for a second. And in a moment, as we hear this song, I'm going to invite you to just come and either to either side, take that card, put it in the basket, and uh, Arian and I will be on each side, just there to greet you, to congratulate you for this moment. And take one of these with you. Take the clothespin with it as well. Take it home as a reminder of God's resurrection power. You know, I was talking about at the beginning where the veil gets thin, and for me, one of the thinnest moments of my life was being in the room when both my parents passed into eternity. Something I can't describe. There's a picture here that, that Ariana happened to take during the last moments of my mother's life and there's so much beautiful symbolism in this picture, but as she was there, we stayed the night in her apartment. And it was it was just her and her sons. Her four boys were there with her. And in the middle of the night, just before she took her last breath, she had been, she'd lost her hearing, and she said, I hear something. She was saying this, I hear something. What, what is that? Someone's talking, and we said, there's no one here. It was silent, she said. She said, I hear my name. Someone is calling my name. She was at the thinnest place. Jesus is calling your name. He's moved heaven and earth so that you could know him. And I just pray your heart would be open today to respond to what God is saying. So as we hear this song, I want you to hear your name and respond as God is leading today. And let's celebrate what Easter is all about. Just open your heart 
on Daybreak Live too and part of this there's people there that love to interact with you and hear what God's saying to you and, and it's it's so powerful when our hearts are open we respond to what God's doing and he's doing something here and sometimes in those sacred moments that we can just be filled with emotion and not really know what to do but I just want to I want to thank you for your obedience this morning for hearing God's voice and responding because I I know I've had moments like this in my life where it just changed. I realized Jesus was the solution. Even though I was following him, I was looking other places. I was needing a direction in my life. Maybe didn't even know it. Or there was a, a moment for me and for some of you this morning and many of us here in our past where God gave us that salvation moment where we we surrendered our life to him for the first time and those of you that grabbed that red that red piece of cloth I just want to celebrate that with you and I think for those that did especially for that one that grabbed that red cloth and said today's my first time I know that's something that really gets us pretty fired up here at daybreak and I think it would be appropriate for us to just celebrate with a little noise those who made that decision today. Well, as we continue our service today, we, we're cheerful and generous givers at daybreak. We're touching and changing lives whenever we give, and we're going to receive our offering at this time. And as we do that, it's a moment for us to celebrate the goodness of God. So as you give, just give cheerfully. We're giving to God. And as that comes in through daybreak, we're changing lives in our neighborhoods, around the world, and lives young and old. It's making a difference. Right now, there's children gathered together and their lives are being changed because of our generosity. Families, wells being dug. So many things are happening. And God uses what we give. And so I pray that he blesses you as you give. And we're going to turn the corner here. We're going to start to celebrate. Today is a celebration. It's Easter. It's resurrection. It's power. It's life. So we're going to celebrate that as we give here. Let's do it. Here we go. Here we go. 
This is a, also a day of family. We know you're going to be with family and friends today. And this is us. You met Ariana. Sophie had prom last night. She got up out of bed, so congratulations. Good job. But we're so glad, from our family to yours, we're so glad you've been here and been with us at Daybreak. We want to say happy Easter to you. We hope to see you next week. Go live the resurrection power. God bless. God bless.